I'm Spencer Mazik, and joining me now is lawyer turned social gaming developer Che Hong. He is one of the founders of Astro Ape Studios and is currently a director at Zynga and a partner at Blackgate Ventures. Welcome, Che. Thank you for joining us today. Thank you very much for having me, Spencer. So please tell me that I didn't completely butcher your name just uh, then. Uh, <laughs> you're actually, you're one of the only people like I've ever pronounced it right on the first try. So that's uh. That's really good on your part. Yeah. Okay, great. Thanks. So let's, um, be, let's, as always, let's begin with law school. You okay. went to Fordham Law School. So what were your reasons, Che, for going to law school? Law school. We're going straight back to the dark yes. past. You know, that's, that's a hard subject. <laughs> back in the day. So, uh, you know, I, I thought, you know, if the reason why I went to law school was basically because, you know, it's probably not the best reason in the world. There was more of like the idealistic kind of thoughts and driver behind why I went. And it was, you know, my parents were immigrants to this country. And so... I thought maybe you know I could I could do better and I can help people that were that were in similar situations as them when they first immigrated here. But in terms of immigration status and other things, that and also just being like doing maybe some pro bono work and just helping people in general, you know. But um, aside from that, you know, the seventy five percent reason was that after going to undergrad, after graduating from undergrad, I moved to Japan, taught English for two years, and I was like, I loved it. I I'm having a a blast out here, but mm -hmm. I've got to do something with my life, and so. Um, so being, law was a very practical decision. It for was, you then. and you know, I was uh, I wasn't an engineer. Um, grad school is is an absolute necessity in my family, and so, <laughs> and uh, I wasn't going to be a doctor, so I was like, I'll, I'll try law school, try my hand at that. And, and so, yeah, and you did fun formation and sports law at Proskauer for did. three years after did. graduation. Yeah, so, did you enjoy your experience there at the firm? I so. The, the political answer is yes, I loved it. I love the firm. I love everyone there. They're watching probably right now. But um, the, the, the real answer is I got very lucky. And so I started in 08. And so literally I started September 15th, 2008. And so that means a lot here at Bloomberg because September 14th, 2008 was a day that Lehman went under. Mm, and so that's right. Proskauer at the time was based at 1585 Broadway, right kind of a block away from Lehman. And so as I was walking with my new briefcase and my new shoes, it's like first day of school all over again. <laughs> I saw people walking with boxes out of their office. And so it was very sobering. And so the reason why I was lucky was not only did I keep my job throughout the entire time, but more importantly, I fell into a, a good practice, a good mix. And so, you know, sometimes Proskauer gets a, a reputation as being a meat grinder, but that wasn't my experience at all. I worked with, you know, in fun formation, Chip Parsons, beautiful, great guy, you know, John Oram in sports. And so I was doing work that I wanted to do with people that were nice to me. And so... Mm -hmm. Well, if you were doing the things that you wanted to do with uh -huh. nice folks, why did you leave back in 2010? So I found myself always kind of peering at the documents and sitting there, not billing hours, but just reading through the businesses of our clients. In terms of, so we would have a client, we'd form a fund, or we would, uh, you know, kind of do a secondary offering, and I would just stay after work. And so this makes me seem like a huge nerd, but I would stay after and read about the business and see what the client did. And I found myself very fascinated with that. And I found myself be like, hey, you know, a lot of these, these things, you know, like I, I looked into the backgrounds of the founders of the companies and it's just like these people, you know, they're smart guys and they took the opportunity to really do something big. And I, and I just thought, you know, why not, why not try it? And so sometimes, you know, I'm not the most cerebral, but in certain aspects, I am very cerebral in that, you know, I just did the math in my head. So I literally Googled um, life expectancy in the USA. <laughs> no, you didn't. And so I did. It's 78.64 years. And so you just do the math, right? 78.64 years. You minus 21 years of education because, you know, you throughout most of your life, you're going to go through school right. and all that. You might minus maybe 14 years of retirement where maybe you won't be, a, you'll be infirm towards the end or, you, you know, you're getting old. Or you, you probably just want to enjoy life. Grind. You don't want to work. Exactly. So you minus 14 years for that, say, you know, a 14 year retirement. That's pretty short, you know. Um, so you're at 35 years, so 78 minus 34, we're at 43 years. Is lawyers doing math? This is not, you know. Yeah, yeah. So 43 years, um, you minus the points. You, 0.64 is like a rounding error. And so play fantasy football, you go out to eat, 0.64 is gone. And so you're basically left with 40 some odd years of your life. And so if you say it takes eight years to do something big with your life, to really reinvent yourself, to do something uh, that you like and that you can potentially be big at or be good at, then basically the math says you have five shots. Mm -hmm. You have five cracks at the bat in this lifetime. 
I like that, the five shots there. But you, as you mentioned Lehman earlier, though, you left mm -hmm. during a time when law firms were laying off associates and also I, staff and deferring offers. So did you consider it very risky for you to leave during a time of uncertainty? Oh, absolutely. And so it, it's, you'll, so when you transition from any career, actually, to a new career, there's never a time where it's, it's going to be 100% safe. And so it was really like diving off the deep end of the pool with, without a lifeguard on duty. You know, I would say usually there's a lifeguard on duty if, if the law firms are doing well and you can always come back. But um, I was, you know, I just kind of tried to swim and uh, wanted to see if I could stay afloat. And um, luckily, luckily it worked out. So yeah, absolutely. Yeah, but did you have any student loans or any other financial obligations at the time that you were concerned about uh, so, yeah. repaying? <laughs> so Spencer, you're right. I, somewhere back home, my parents are like, that's what we were telling them too, you know. And so, right. Yeah. But uh, I did. I had student loans, but um, it just the math just always worked out in my head. Like the math, not in terms of dollars, but in terms of happiness of of, of my life. And then I knew, you know, I had probably worked about eight years just to get this point being an attorney. I knew I wasn't gonna, you know, go for the partnership run. And so at that point, you know, I'm really burning other kind of at bats. And so probably I had about four left. And so. If I didn't take it now, then I'd have three left. You know, next you, thing I knew. You mentioned your parents. So, what did your family and friends think then about you, your departure from law? Well, it's you know, my, my mom said she's like, most people work most of their adult lives to get somewhere, and a lot of times they end up being a doctor and lawyer. So you actually did that, but then now you want to leave that behind, and not only maybe you know, if I said I'm going to be a doctor or I'm going to try this or that, she would have been okay with it. But I basically you know told my family and you know my my fiance at the time you know like you know I'm gonna make video games and it's gonna be big you know and so I already got flack because I would always play video games at home and so it was like did this kid ever grow up you know and so I, I don't think I ever did it. And so you did you made video games so before forming Astro Ape did mm -hmm. you or your partners have any actual game design experience? Zero. So we knew zero. zero. So we knew what we liked. We knew like um, we knew a good game when we played it and when we saw it, and so usually that's not good enough. But for um, for 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 games, I think it's it's actually refreshing because you have a lot of gaming veterans that like have been making games a long time, and some of them get pretty jaded over time because they're they're no longer making games because that's what they would like to play, but they make it because that's what probably will be successful. But then for us, we always wanted to make high quality social games that we would want to play, that we would be proud of making, and so we came in as as complete outsiders. Um, you know, went straight to mobile and, and luckily had success there. You know, I think it's incredible that you're, you and your team, you were motivated by your interest in gaming, but it had to take a little bit more than that to be successful. You had to identify and solve a problem in a large macro. So what was that for you? So for us, that was um, just how, so it was more, so the problem was always, you know, um, how, how do you get people to use your, your smartphone more? And so at the time, you know, smartphones were, were kind of blowing up or there was some adoption, but it wasn't really blowing up yet, you know? And so for us, the problem was that the problem to be solved was basically how do you have people have, you know, make a smartphone like, like a device where they can have a good time on. And so at the time there was only basically Angry Birds, you know? Mm. And so we saw that as, as basically the problem. But, you know, with video games, you're not really solving massive <laughs> social problems. You know, you're kind of just having people waste time. Yeah, you know? yeah, they're um, enjoying themselves. But, uh, you know, the opportunity that we saw was that Everyone was piling into Facebook. You know, the Zynga, Playdom Wars were still going on. I think Playfish had just gotten acquired, but you know, all the big companies were amassing their armies to go after the Facebook platform. And so for us, we saw, you know, we all had iPhones and we were thinking, you know, this is a great platform. Why not use this? Why not put high quality games that, um, that people would probably play on Facebook, but put it on mobile where they, they had the device the entire day. And so um, we did that early. Uh, Apple, I guess, loved um, our story and, and kind of the quality of our game. And, uh, you know, they never tell you when they're going to feature your game. And one morning we literally woke up and it was at the top of, uh, of their featuring. It got like the highest featuring they would give at the time. So tell me what, yeah. what about what I think is probably the fun part. How do you come up with ideas for games? Uh, so, again, it's this uh, PC mode, you know. <laughs> <laughs> but no, we, we sit around and uh, we just, it's, it's like brainstorming, you know. It's, you really like even to this day, you know that you know when we brainstorm about ideas, it feels like just a bunch of guys sitting, guys and girls sitting around the room, um, brainstorming about ideas for the next school project. Really, that's what it feels like. And so um, 
we're just lucky that it's that's the industry that 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 we were in that we we're in you know whereas tech you know you can really get away with that and so um yeah i, I would say that's how we do it. we just sit around a table and just brainstorm sometimes it comes totally randomly you mm -hmm. know you wake up in the morning and just like why didn't i think of this you know you're in the shower oh this would be an awesome game you know but you just never know when when kind of something of that nature will like a great idea will strike you. And so Che, in the beginning, uh -huh. was it difficult finding funding or did you get investors relatively quickly? So it was not glamorous in the beginning, right? You go from or I went from 1585 Broadway, beautiful <laughs> building, Morgan Stanley's in there, you know. Great salary. I had a great suit. I you know, I you that's a great suit. You know, no, I had you. one as well. You know, I, I don't have many. I'm sure anymore. you still have some. I have some, you know, <laughs> probably even nicer than this one. <laughs> but so you know, we um, it, it was uh, it was it was hard times in the beginning. It was just um, um, a few guys. You know, we had no funding. Uh, literally, like we had a fifty dollar marketing budget, um, and it was just hard times. You know, people weren't calling, banging out, down our door in in the beginning. But um, you never know. I th I think. The three things that make um, entrepreneurs successful is hard work, uh, timing, and really that luck. Luck isn't attributed mm. that much, but it is luck, you know? So we made a great game, we worked hard, we thought timing was great, and there was a little bit of luck mix in there. And so when iTunes, uh, when Apple featured our game, uh, suddenly our phones just couldn't stop ringing. Wow. And so um, we got a call from a, a massive company in Japan. Um, and uh, they Dana they, DNA, DNA yeah that's right DNA, yeah so yeah. they DNA. they they flew out here um, their CEO flew out here um, you know we sat down with her at this long kind of scary conference room table very Japanese style she had her whole entourage and the bankers that you know were her handlers sitting across the table from us we walk in you know I'm in jeans sneakers like I wore a button down shirt to you know keep pretty respectful but um, <laughs> it was very intimidating you know and so. Uh, I, you know, but I never knew that day that it would be a life-changing event. So when we started our conversation, uh, she asked, uh, oh, you know, like, um, what, what have you guys been doing? Have you always been in gaming? You know, for us, uh, I told her I taught English in Japan and uh, in basically middle of nowhere Japan. It's like as countryside as you can basically get. And Where so was it? It was called Niigata, Japan. Okay. Niigata is like, it's basically the backwaters of, of Japan. And so... I think even rural areas, they they are like, oh wow, you live in a rural area, you know. And so, uh, I she said, try me, you know. Where do you think? Where 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 did you live? And I told her, I'm from, you know, the Niigata, Japan. And so, for for her, her eyes lit up, and uh, she literally kicked everyone out of the room except us. And she said, I grew up there. Wow, that's so, amazing. Yeah. And so from that, that is day that forward, is your little bit of luck right there. That's a coincidence that not many people would have. That's right. And, and so. From that day, we closed um, a decent amount of funding just within a few weeks. You know, I think we went through two turns of the agreement, and we were done. So, how long was it from the formation of Astro Ape to mm -hmm. its acquisition by Zynga? So, the formation of Astro Ape, I would say, probably the entire run was about two years. But the most amazing part was after we closed funding, there was only about ten months between funding and actually Zynga calling us. And ten uh, months. Uh, 10 That's months. amazing. Yeah, that is so. You know that ride was literally—I can't even explain it. It's like the the the, the most crazy, the craziest roller coaster you can ever imagine. To go from 1585 Broadway to someone's mom's house to <laughs> your own office with funding to being at a, a public company again, a pre a pre IPO company and then a public company, and so it was. Uh, Ten months. It was. It was. It was the ride. And was, of course, I have to ask Jay, how much did Zynga acquire Astro oh, okay. Ape for? <laughs> so it was. Uh, oh wow. Okay. Is it hot in here? <laughs> so uh, it was a lot more at the time because it was pre-IPO. You right. Know? Right. Um, but I think we we all did very well. And Can you so, give us a range? Was it between one and five million, five and ten million, ten and fifteen million? So it, I mean, it was pre-IPO stock. So depending about the mix of cash and stock and how you valued it. It would probably be like easily in in the uh, the eight eight figure range, which is a nice deal. Because how many employees did you have at the time? So we actually grew to twenty one employees oh. by the time we by the time we uh, were acquired. And so um, you know, Zynga had given us a call. You know, when they looked at uh, mobile companies, there was only about four of us at scale at the time, uh, at decent scale at the time, that were funded and, and could just take on projects that could pump out decent games at a at a great clip. And so uh, you know, while they were filing the S one, they were looking around. We need mobile help, and so. Um, they gave us a call, and, uh, and I thought it was the right deal to do at the time. And so now you're a director at Zynga. What exactly does that mean? What do you do there? Oh, so here, yeah. here's. <laughs> so I, uh, 
That's that's a million dollar question, right? I, I, uh, <laughs> so when you're an indie developer running your own business, you basically do everything. You know, I literally wiped down tables. I literally took out the trash. I literally did HR, try to raise funding, you know, help with the acquisition. But suddenly, I found myself um, with not much to do. But it allowed me to get back into the product and to get back with my team. And so um, basically, I was there to not only make sure people were we were we were producing and we were hitting our milestones but also to just uh, make sure that the, the machine is well oiled and that, and that everyone was happy. And so, and in creating social mobile games though, do you use your legal background and training in any way? Uh, so you would be surprised. I think in gaming in general, I would say not so much, but in running your own business, I couldn't think of a better degree to actually have. Maybe an MBA, you know, but in terms of a legal degree, in terms of, you know, Using that to, to, to form your own company and to like really deal with a lot of the HR issues in the beginning and, and just uh, incorporating and doing a lot of the, the kind of low level legal work, it was actually really, really helpful, you know, because it lined up well. I was, I was a junior associate. I think when I left, I was just starting my third year. And so, you know, it was frankly, it was almost the kind of stuff that I was doing during my first year. And so that's, um, amazing. that's great. It was that's doing great. that all over again. So it was, uh, it was actually very helpful, especially towards the end when we were, um, when we were being acquired. And so, a lot of the paperwork, it wasn't foreign to me. I'd seen it, you know, I dabbled in some M&A work. Um, you know, we, we have a, well, Proskauer had a, a general corporate department, and so everyone dabbled in all different work as a junior associate. So it really helped at that stage. That degree came in handy then. It did. Probably still comes in handy now. It so does a little bit. <laughs> can you uh, tell us before we go, though, about yeah. Blackgate Ventures and another company called Boxed, is that right? That's right. So um, Blackgate Ventures, um, it's something we did on the side, and so for us, we felt that you know, for, for venture capitalists, they have a their their big problem, their big pain port is deal flow. But then when we were at Zynga, you know, people always would reach out to us and say, "Hey, you know, I've got this game. I've had I had this company. You know, how did you guys sell the company? How did you guys raise funding? How did you get to scale?" You know, we just found that it actually wasn't a problem for us, and we saw a lot of great bets to be made out there. And so we used uh, some of the cash we set it aside that we got from uh, from the acquisition, and uh, we started making kind of strategic bets in, in companies we love. And so. Um, you know, our criteria is only that it has to be mobile, you know, or mobile first, um, and that we can add value. So I, I, we've, we've seen a lot of deals where, um, uh, or a lot of companies that, you know, are great bets, but, you know, we can't add a lot of value. And so it's, you know, for us, we're not a pure VC, so it's, it's not, that, not that interesting to us. And so our main project now is actually uh, Boxed. And so we'll be launching a, a new uh, mobile only, mobile first uh, commerce company pretty soon. So. Just like we were early in uh, mobile gaming, um, it seems like there's going to be a huge uptick in mobile commerce. Not many people buy on their smartphones now, but I think that impending kind of wave is coming, and we want to we want to be at the top of that wave when it does come. Yeah, you guys are always identifying some problem or something that hasn't been addressed yet, <laughs> and and solving it. And that's how that's the key to your success. So thanks so much, Che, for being here to talk about your mini ventures. We really appreciate it. Thank you very much. For more information on this or other topics, subscribe to BloombergLaw.com. You can follow us on Facebook and Twitter. Thank you for joining us. Bye, everybody.